You are in the meeting now. Recording in progress. All right. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are we doing today? Awesome. All right. Um, so, um, I, according to the calendar, um, uh, I have I'm con I have set aside uh, Monday and Wednesday to address any questions over assignment eight. Um, however, based upon the responses I got as far as questions um, on Monday, um, I I suggested that you go ahead and take a look at assignment nine notes as well, and uh, we could get a jump on assignment nine. So my my job today is to make sure that we are satisfied with uh, our the the problems that we're have a grasp on how to solve the problems in assignment eight and also to look at any questions in assignment nine um, and we'll just see how the day goes and see what we're going to tackle on Friday. Um, perhaps we can tackle assignment ten on Friday. Um, I also got your exams graded. Uh, exams are graded. Uh, grades are posted in Blackboard. Um, and you can also view 
your graded exam on Gradescope. So I, I sent out an email announcement about that, but I just wanted to spend a little bit of time just kind of going over that process. So um, let's take a look at Blackboard real quick. And before I do that, I need to log out of log out of that. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna turn that on. That would help. So um, we are in uh, our course in Blackboard. So the first thing that you can do is you can find the key to the exam under course content um, down at the bottom down there uh, after week 15 exam quiz, exam quiz keys folder um, and there you can look at the key to um, Uh, exam one. There is the key to exam one, um, and you can look through that key. Uh, there were a couple of. Let's see that? Yeah, uh, I had to go back and fix a couple of things. So there's a couple of uh, annotations I had to make on this uh, key. Um, but anyways. There's the key that you can look at, and now let's go and talk about how do you get access to your exam. So it doesn't matter what uh, link you use. Um, in fact, I can get to that key exam right here just going by week one assignments. It's going to take me into Gradescope. Uh, here's all of your graded uh, or any of your things that you just uh, Submitted into Gradescope. If we go to Exam One, um, what you will see is you'll see um, your uploaded copy of Exam One. Notice that there's nothing on there. Uh, it's it's it, there's no annotations. There's no, no nothing. But if you start clicking these questions over here, you can start to see oh. If I zoom in on question two, uh, there's a kind of a box in region, and there's an annotation that check mark. Um, you can also see any uh, comments that I made, um, and this is a very nice way to go through this question by question. I prefer to look at the down at the graded copy. So if you go down here to the bottom where it says download graded copy. Alright, so you're going to get this initial, initial page um, where it's going to give you question one. Uh, it's going to tell you how many points you got out of the possible four. It's also going to give you any comments. Um, it'll show you um, I, if you missed any points that will be read. And you can also come here and look at the full annotated uh, exam. So you can see here my check marks. Um, yours would look different. And if I made any comments, you'll have a page of comments as well. Um, so I prefer to download a graded copy uh, to look at. Um, that way you can see all the comments and your graded exam. And uh, you can compare that again by going and looking at the uh, key. Again, the key is found. Uh, just go to course content, uh, exam uh, quiz keys. Um, 
So, your job, your job as a student um, is to go and look at your exam and compare your exam to the quiz key. Look at the problem specifically, the ones where you missed some points, and go and determine for yourself what happened, where the error was. Um, <coughs> look at the comments that I make um, and learn from your mistakes. That's your job. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole entire class period going over the exam. Um, one main reason why is for the most part, uh, y'all did really good. For the most part, y'all did really good. Most of the grades, uh, well over, I think 60% of the grades were um, C or better. Um, so that's pretty good in my book. Um, those of y'all that didn't do so well, y'all got some work to do. Y'all have some, um, you know, y'all got to put in the extra time and effort to understand uh, what happened, understand your errors, and start to make corrections. Um, I'm not saying correct the test because I don't pick up corrective exams, um, but you need to learn from your mistakes. <clears throat> I'm here to help. Um, so if you want to, uh, at any time during the class, uh, say, hey, can you go over this exam problem, or you want to shoot me an email uh, talking about a specific question, please do so. Uh, that's part of my job is to be available to you, um, but you have to do that initial outreach. Um, so that's really all I had to say about the exam. Again, for the most part, um, job well done. And uh, so let's uh, transition um, from me speaking to how can I assist you. Uh, any homework questions that are lingering that we want to have a look at? On assignment A, yes. I don't understand how to get the all right. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask you to assignment A, and what are you having an issue with? Um, how to know how to know the water. Can you tell me which, I, I didn't quite catch that. Could you tell me what problem number you're looking at? 11E. 11E. And F. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Eleven, and we're looking at assignment eight. Yes. Okay. Um, so we're talking about even and odd functions and intercepts. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, um, before I specifically address problem number 11, um, let me address uh, the uh, two things, um, even slash odd functions. So, by definition, an even function um, is symmetrical about, what happened? Oops, let me undo that. About the y 
So, for illustration purposes, this would be an even function because it's symmetrical about the y-axis. If you were to take this and take that y-axis and spin it 180 degrees, this, you would get the same image on both the left and the right. That is symmetrical. <coughs> Excuse me, symmetrical about the y axis. You could have another graph that would be symmetrical about the y axis. You could have something like this. Um, that graph would be symmetrical about the y axis. All right, so that's what makes um, a function even. And so all we're doing is we're just analyzing the graphs and deciding whether a function is even or odd. Um, going back to continuing our definitions, an odd function is what we call symmetrical about... the origin. So what does that mean? Well, um, there's really two types of symmetry going on. <coughs> so you kind of got to see this. Um, if I were to reflect this right side of the graph about the y-axis, we would get that graph. And then if I were to reflect, reflect this about the x-axis, that's how we get this part of the graph. That's what we say symmetric about the origin. So not only are you rotating about the y-axis, but you're also rotating about the x-axis. That is symmetric about the origin. So, for our practical purposes, all we have to do is just look at the graph to determine whether a function is even or odd. Now, your question specifically about problem number 11, and I'm not going to spend the time trying to replicate exactly what 11 looks like, but it looks something like this. Um, Looks something like that. Now, here's the question. Is it even or odd? So, there, there should really be another option there. Um, I, should, I should give you some options. Is it even? Is it odd? Or is it neither? You should realize that you also have a third option there. So, if I look at this and I ask, is it symmetrical about the y-axis? Well, it's certainly not symmetrical about the y-axis. Because if I were to pretend like this was a mirror, and I would say, does the left side reflect the right side? And the answer is no. Well, this is not symmetrical about the y-axis. Um, so it's not even. Then I would ask the question, is it symmetrical about the origin? Well, if I take this side of the graph, <coughs> rotate it about the y-axis, and then rotate it about the x-axis, do we get a mirror image? And the answer is no. The answer is not odd. So what does that leave us with? It's neither even or odd. So does that make sense of 11 part E? Yes, it does. Okay. Now, the next question is, what are the intercepts?
So we have two types of intercepts. We have x-intercepts. This is where the graph crosses the x-axis. Now, every single x-intercept is going to be of the form, um, we'll call it A0, where you're going to have some value for A that's on the x-axis, and then um, 0 is always going to be the value for your y-coordinate. And then you have your y-intercept, which is where the graph crosses the y-axis, and these are going to be the form B0, or 0B, excuse me. So, I, uh, I didn't draw this perfectly. Um, let me make a slight adjustment here on this graph. The graph behaves more like this. Again, this is not perfect. So, question. If I look at this graph, and I ask myself, where does it cross the x-axis? So again, putting some labels on things. There's my x-axis, there's my y-axis. If I ask the question, where does it cross the x-axis? It crosses the x-axis, or in other words, where does it touch the x-axis? It has the x-axis here and here. So you have this graph uh, nicely detailed on your paper, but we should be able to identify that the x-axis, the x-intercepts are at negative 2, 0, and at 0, 0. Looking at your homework, do you agree? Okay, so there's your x-intercepts. Now, where are our y-intercepts? Where does it cross the y-axis? Well, so then that you can start to realize anytime that you have an x-intercept at the origin, you also have a y-intercept. Because that's where the x and y-axis cross. So we have a y-intercept at 0, 0. So does that answer your questions about 11 D and E, or uh, E and F, excuse me? Yes, thank you. You're very welcome. Let me, let me, let me ask a question. This is a what if scenario. What if What if instead of a solid circle, like you see on your paper, you have a solid circle right here at negative two zero. What if that was an open circle? Would that mean that this is an x-intercept? Yes or no? The answer would be no. The answer would be no. This is not an intercept. And here's why. Open circles uh, mean that we get close to, but not exactly. So if you were to be writing this graph, Let's write the graph from right to left. So I'm going down, 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 down. I cross the x-intercept here at 0, 0. Then I start coming back up. So I'm going to get really, really close to negative 2 on the x-axis. But I'm never going to reach it because I have an open circle. So open circles mean that we get close to, but we're not going to get exactly that value. 
Whereas over here, because we have that solid circle, that means we get exactly to that value. So that's something to be <coughs> thinking of when you're looking at and analyzing these graphs. Okay, good question. What else can we look at? Can you do um, maximum and minimum? Sure. Does it matter which problem? No, it doesn't. I just don't understand how to do you say that again, please. All right, so maxima and minima. Um, <coughs> Another way that we could define these would be something called a local max or a local min. Uh, these are not the same as your absolute max or your absolute min. So, if I were to just draw a graph If I were to draw a graph that looked something like this, all right. <coughs> so first of all, we have to recognize that because of the arrows, we know that this graph continues going up. This would be called an absolute max, and that, of course, would be. Uh, infinity. So it's going up to infinity. This would be an absolute min. Um, it would be going down to negative infinity. All right. So the things that we're concerned about are places like this point, which would be a maxima or a local max. And this point right here, which would be a minima or a local min. So the reason that we say that they're local max or min is if all I was looking at was this part of the graph, if that's all I saw, this would be the maximum of this particular region. But when you zoom out, you realize oh, the graph reaches higher points over here. So it's not the maxima, or it's not the max of the graph, it's just a local max. Same thing can be said down here. If I just zoom in, oh, that's the lowest point on the graph. That, that's, if this is all the graph that you saw, you'd say this is the lowest point. But when you zoom out, you realize, oh, it's not the lowest point because the graph continues going down over here. So when we say what are the local max and min, we're going to be looking for the corresponding x values. So we'll call this x1, y1, where the corresponding x values, x2, y2. So we would say that for this problem, I have a maxima, or you could also say local max. at x1 comma y1 and then you have a minima 
at x2, y2. So let's put this in the context of a problem. Um, I don't know. Um, so problem number 10 is too similar. So let's just take a look at problem number Uh, let's take a look at problem number 11 again. So, before I look at problem number 11, I just want to emphasize that you can have more than one local max or min. Um, if you had a function that did this. So, here you, you have a max here you have a maxima, here you have a minima, and here you have another minima. You don't just have to have one maxima and one minima, you can have multiple ones. So when I look at problem number 11, so again, roughly speaking, this graph looks like this. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so a couple of things to be thinking about. Um, this would be a, a minima right here. That would be a min. And if we look at the points on the graph, we can determine that that point occurs at negative 4, negative 5. Now, because this is an open circle, because this is an open circle, even though we can decide, oh, this is at negative 2, uh, negative 1, even though that's an open circle, because it's an open because it's an open circle, we cannot define this as a maximum because it, it really never actually reaches the point negative two, uh, negative two, negative one because it's an open circle. So that's not a max. Now, if I were to zoom in just on this part of the graph, and if I were to just look at this part of the graph, I could declare that this would be a max or a max, maxima. And what are the coordinates of that point? The coordinates of that point are at negative 2, 0. Now, again, if I zoom in on the graph, the graph is doing this, this point right here would be a min, a local minimum. It's a minimum point on a portion on the graph. And we can decide what those coordinates are. If you just look at the graph, it looks like it's at negative 1, negative 1. So we got two minimas. I got a max. Now let's just zoom in on other parts of the graph. If I were to just zoom in on this portion of the graph, I'm just looking at this portion. There's a max. And where are the coordinates of that max? 1, 3. So, I'm just looking, I'm not looking at the graph as a whole, I'm looking at portions of the graph. So you gotta kind of use your imagination to zoom in and find where are the high points and where are the low points. Now because this is a solid circle, we get to declare that this is a max. Unlike down here, this is an open circle, 
we cannot declare that to be a maxima. And then right here, again, if I were... <coughs> excuse me. If I were to look at this, this is like the Great Plains of West Texas. I mean, this is as high as we get out here for as far as the eye can see. So this is a max. And where is this at? This max is at... Um, if you look at where the graph starts, if you come down here, that's at 3. Um, and this point right here is 5. So, I mean, you have an infinite number of things like 3, 5, and then 4, 5, and then 6, 5. So, the easiest way to say this um, would be um, for all x that are greater than or equal to 3, uh, we have a max at 5. For all x's that are greater than 3, so as x goes to 3, to 4, to 5, to 10, to 100, to a million, this stays constant. It's always 5. <coughs> oh man, excuse me. Does that help answer your question about max and min? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Did we look at problem 29 and 30 on Monday? Yes? Okay. Yes, sir. Y'all good with difference, difference quotients? Because I'll say that there's a 100% guarantee. <laughs> There's a 100% guarantee that you'll see those again. What else can we look at? Can we look at another problem like 29? Sure. find f of x plus h minus f of x all over h for negative 31x plus 25. Uh, let me rewrite that. For f of x Now, <coughs> I've, I've chosen some, you know, larger numbers than what you saw in, F, in problem number 29, but it's not going to stop us from uh, doing this problem. So as I did on Monday, it's essentially three parts. Now, we already know what f of x is. <coughs> what we got to go through and do is find f of x plus h. So I'm going to replace this x in f of x with x plus h.
then we'll distribute and there is our f at x plus h so now it's just a matter of putting everything together just gotta put everything together now So we have sort of fraction bar now good practice is to put minus and put f of x in parentheses so that you remember to distribute the minus sign. So that we remember to distribute the minus sign. So this becomes plus 31x minus 25 all over h. Now, every single time that you do this, stuff cancels out. You tell me, what do you see that cancels out? You tell me. The X's. The X's. What else? The constant. The 25's. And at this point, even if you have multiple terms up here in your numerator, which we can do another problem where this happens, you can cancel out an H from every single term. In this case, we're left with a negative 31. <coughs> now, let me ask you a question. Problem number 29, problem number 29, f of x was equal to um, 2x minus 5, and then when we went through and did our difference quotient, the answer is or we got 2. Alright, you remember that? And we probably did another problem on Monday. I can't remember. But look at this. We just did a problem where we had a negative 31x plus 25 and the answer was 31. Does anybody see the connection? Does anybody see the connection? You see, you see the. Can anybody take a gander that if I said let f of x be equal to a negative one half x plus three? Can anybody take a guess? An educated guess? What the difference quotient is going to be? Negative one half. Very good. Very good. Do you see it? Two, two. Negative thirty one, negative thirty one. One half, negative one half. Now, that's only true for these functions where you have a 2 or something times x minus plus or minus something else. It changes as soon as we start saying x squared and such. So do you all need to see one worked out where you have the x squared? 
Or do we have other questions? Can we see the X squared one? Sure. I'm going to say this also. If I give you this question on an exam, you better show me the work. If you just say negative one half without any work, you're going to get it wrong. You have to show me the work. You have to go through this process right here. You have to show me the work. No work, no credit. All right, let's do one with an x squared. So let's let j of x be equal to x squared minus x plus 1. Let's find j at x plus h minus j of x all over h. So the first thing I want to find is this j at x plus h. So that's going to be x plus h quantity squared minus x plus h plus 1. And I told you to memorize x plus h squared. Just know it. It'll save you a whole lot of time. <coughs> so this becomes x squared plus a 2xh plus h squared minus x minus h plus 1. And there is our j at x plus h. And we already know that j of x is this. So it's just a matter now of plugging things in. So I have an x squared plus a 2xh plus an h squared minus an x minus an h plus 1 minus all of f of x all over h. Now, every single time I do this, you're going to see me put f of x in parentheses and go through this distributing process. Minus x minus h plus 1 minus an x squared plus an x minus 1 all over h. And this is where stuff starts canceling out. x squared cancel out, your x's cancel out, and your 1's cancel out. Essentially, everything that doesn't have an h attached to it will cancel out. So we're left with 2xh plus h squared minus h over h. You can factor out an h out of your numerator. And then your h's cancel out, leaving you with 2x plus h minus 1. Now, there is a connection, a shorthand connection between this and your original j, function j of x, but I'll leave it to your calculus instructor if you decide to go through and take calculus to show you that connection uh, because this is, again, we're dipping our fingers into uh, one of the fundamental, <laughs> one of the fundamental, oh, excuse, excuse me, one of the fundamental theorems of calculus. All right, I got about two minutes left. What else can we look at?
Do y'all finish the uh, homework uh, eight? Are y'all done? Yeah? Most everybody? All right. So, with that being said, we'll pick up with assignment nine on Friday. We will have a quiz on Friday over, uh, at this point, just assignment eight. You can probably bet your buttons that there will be a difference quotient, probably a piecewise function, uh, probably some interpreting graphs on that quiz. So make sure that you're comfortable with uh, all the ins and outs of this assignment. Um, again, if you have any questions over... Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Thank you. If you have any questions over the exam... After you spend some time looking at it, feel free to email me. Um, I would very much like to address any questions that you have. All right, so if that's it, um, I'll just go ahead and cancel class or dismiss class for the rest of our time. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Y'all have a good day. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Adios. See you later. Your conference is now over. Goodbye.